This morning's scripture reading is from the book of Exodus, chapter 20, verses 1 through 6. And God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. This is the word of the Lord. We're in a series in which each week we look at one of the attributes of God, one of the characteristics of God according to the Bible. And this week we get uh, to uh, the jealousy of God. Perhaps the most offensive of all the things the Bible says about God, even probably to contemporary ears, uh, more offensive than even to talk about the wrath of God. Uh, and actually, it's a challenge to, um, uh, for me as a teacher to get this right because of the, uh, the particularly uh, nuanced understanding of jealousy that the term jealousy of God conveys. But it's important. Now, they're all important, of course. But uh, when, when Chris Smith, the, uh, the uh, well-known sociologist who's written several landmark Uh, studies of religious beliefs and religious life of younger adults, teenagers and younger adults in America. He's written a couple of these important books. He tried to summarize where most people in America are, especially most young people in America are when it comes to religious beliefs. And he summed it up by calling it moralistic therapeutic deism. Deism means there is a God, but he's not intimately... Uh, connected to my daily life. And moralistic therapeutic refers to this understanding of God. That is, if I do my part, if I live a pretty moral life and I live a pretty decent life and I care for people, then it's God's job to meet my needs. Moralistic therapeutic deism. If I do my part, it's God's job to meet my needs. And he's not necessarily there all the time in every moment of my life, but I believe in him, and there he is. And if I live a good enough life, that's what he ought to be doing for me. And this attribute of God blows that whole paradigm completely out of the water. This text will show us, let's talk about the jealousy of God, what it is, what it calls for from us, and how we can answer that call. What it is, what it calls for from us, and how we can answer that call. First of all, what it is. We have to, we're going to have to wrestle here with what, what the jealousy of God is. And it's, it's, a, it's right here in the middle of the Ten Commandments. You can't just say, well, it's in these strange remote parts of the Bible. No. <laughs> right in the middle of the Ten Commandments, which is the core of the Bible, if there is a core. Um, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, verse 5. By the way, it's not just an Old Testament thing. Uh, Paul in 1 Corinthians 3 is talking to the Corinthian Christians, and he says, he says, look at what you're doing. Are you trying to provoke God's jealousy? In other words, uh, the jealousy of God is something that the whole Bible teaches. So there it is. But it, it is confusing. And one of the reasons it's confusing is that jealousy everywhere in the Bible is called a sin for everybody else. <laughs> um, you know, it, so, you know, for example... Uh, uh, you know, here's, there's many examples. First Corinthians 3.3, 3, where Paul says, you are still worldly because there is jealousy and quarreling among you. Or Romans 13.13, 13, do, not, do nothing in, with dissension and jealousy. Uh, many times, if you look at lists of sins, when there's a long list of sins, jealousy is in the list. And of course, uh, and we'll get back to this in a second, one of the great tragedies, uh, tragic stories of the Bible is Saul, King Saul, who became eaten up with jealousy over David and his popularity, and it turned him into an evil person. So everywhere in the Bible, you have jealousy as being a sin, except here when it comes to God. Well, what's, what's with that? And the answer is that um, 
This word jealousy is a little bit like the word fear in the Bible. Because the word fear almost everywhere else is a negative word. And even in the Bible, the Bible tells us, uh, you know, angels are always saying, fear not, fear not. And yet, the Bible says there's a kind of fear that's a godly fear, and it's called the fear of God. So there's a bad fear and a good fear in the Bible, a good, bad fear and a godly fear. Well, actually, there is a bad jealousy, which is most jealousy, but there's also a godly jealousy. And even a human being can have it, though very few do. And Paul talks about this in 2 Corinthians eleven two when he says, I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. I promised you to one husband, to Christ, to present him, to present you pure to him. We'll get back to that text. But there's Paul saying, I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. And he puts the word godly in because he knows that that's not the normal kind of jealousy. So what in the world is the difference between normal jealousy, wrongful jealousy, and godly jealousy, or, the, or godlike jealousy? And here's what it is. Normal jealousy is what you do see in Saul. It's basically envy. And here's King Saul... And uh, the people love King, the King Saul. But then along comes this new young champion, David. You know, and he slays Goliath, and he's and he's he's a terrific general, and he's attractive, and he's a poet, and and uh, you know things started going bad when they had a parade, and Saul heard them sing, "Saul has slain his thousands, but David his ten thousands." (laughs) What did they mean by that? And, of course, what happened was eventually Saul realized that David was taking the love of his people away from Saul, and David was more popular. And David, in other words, David was taking uh, the, 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 the people's love away from Saul, and Saul went crazy. And uh, uh, he was filled with anger because he was losing love. And he got angry at the people for rejecting him. But he most of all, of course, got angry at David. He envied David's uh, uh, attractiveness. He envied David's character and popularity. And it turned him into an evil, murderous man. Why? Because envious love is basically selfish. It's basically about you. It starts being upset because I've lost love. But it ends in nothing but destructive anger. It's all about your ego. It's all about your hurt pride. And, and therefore, what happens is love is replaced by anger. Uh, love, is, uh, l- love goes away, and you get very angry, and you w- can even attack the person whose love you lost because you're so angry at them. But then there's godly jealousy. And now let me, let me show you the context for Paul. Uh, as I've wrestled as your, as your teacher trying to help you understand this very nuanced idea the jealousy of God. This is a very key verse, uh, passage. It's 2 Corinthians 11. And Paul is really upset with the Corinthians' behavior. And you already heard him me read this. He says, I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy because I promised you to one husband to Christ. And then he goes on the next verse and says, I'm afraid your minds are being led astray from pure devotion to Christ. And he says... Um, For when someone comes along to preach a different gospel to you than the gospel we preached, you receive it easily enough. He's, Paul is not being sweet in this passage. Paul is being sarcastic. Paul is being strong. Paul is being confrontive. Paul is angry. And here's where we have to see this balance. Paul's love for them is angered love. Paul's love for them and he's angry with them. He says, what are you doing? Why are you going in this direction? What is wrong with you? I do not want to let you live this way. It's not good for you. His love is angered love, but it's godly because it stays love. Godly jealousy is angered love that stays love. And it's not so much about you and your hurt pride It's about the loss of the relationship. Or put another way, godly jealousy is love fighting extinction. Normal jealousy is love gone extinct because of your self-centeredness and because of your hurt pride and now you just hate the person who loved you before. But godly jealousy is angered love that stays love 
and stays committed to rescuing that crumbling love relationship and getting that person back. And that's the reason why, in the end, godly je- when we, say, we talk about the jealousy of God, we're talking about something that's really unique in the world. In the ancient times, everybody uh, had multiple gods. You had this God and that God, and you had to deal with many gods. And, of course, some gods you had to deal with more than others, but you had to keep them all happy. And therefore, religion, pagan religion, back in those days, was a lot like politics. <laughs> Always having little compromises, keeping everybody happy, keeping a lot of different balls in the air. And God comes along and says, no, no. If you're going to relate to me, it's not like politics. It's more like a marriage. For God to say, I'm a jealous God, is to say, I don't want you to treat me the way you treat other gods. I want your exclusive commitment. I want to be at the center of your life, and I want it to be a love relationship. And therefore, relating to me is more like a marriage. It's not like politics. And and today, the the jealous God not only, back in those days, created a unique thing, totally unique, the idea of of an exclusive commitment to one God at the very center of your life. That was crazy. It's just as crazy today. Now, there's a lot of people who believe in God, But it's moralistic therapeutic deism, which means I kind of believe in God. He's certainly at the center of my life. He's around. I ask him for things. And I assume that it's his job to meet my needs, you know, at this and that. Uh, That is just so, um, that is so vague. That is much more like, uh, well, frankly, as C.S. Lewis says in The Problem of Pain, we really don't want a father in heaven. We want a grandfather in heaven. If you ever noticed that fathers and mothers with their little kids are very demanding. You can't do that. You can't do that. Honey, don't do that. You mustn't eat that. You mustn't eat that. Don't give them to a grandfather because the grandfather just wants the kid to like him. You know, and when the grandfather gets them, you just, you just, you know, you let them do whatever you want. See? And that's why, Paul, that's why Lewis very wisely said, you know, we talk about, oh, I believe in a loving God. We don't really believe in father, a, a loving God who's a father. And we certainly don't believe in a loving God who's a husband. We believe in a loving God who's sort of a grandfather, or maybe just a kind of, even worse than that, you know, just, some, you know, just someone who just wishes you well and supports you in whatever it is that you think is important for you. That's not a jealous God. A jealous God. A jealous God says, I want a love relationship with you, which is exclusive and it's intense, and that gets us into our next, our, our next point. If that is what the jealousy of God is, Angered love, if you turn away from him, that stays love and doesn't turn evil, then what in the world kind of relationship is it calling for? See, the jealousy of God is calling for a relationship. When we say we believe he's a jealous God, what does that mean? It means he's calling for a particular kind of relationship, which is the closest thing we've got on earth to it is marriage. So what kind of relationship is it? And I would say it's marked then by three things. Priority, fidelity, and intimacy. Let's spend a little bit of time on that. And you can see it by the context. Now, it's a little awkward to be preaching out of this text. As you know, this is the Ten Commandments. And so the way ordinarily you always preach over texts like this is you say, well, what is the first commandment? What is the second commandment? I'm going to try to pull back and take more of a top-level view of this text because ultimately I do think the Ten Commandments is, is showing us a jealous God. God is saying, and oh, it's so important to understand the Ten Commandments in the context of the jealousy of God. The Ten Commandments isn't busy work. This is God saying to you, this is, I'm a jealous God. I want this kind of relationship with you. And by obeying the Ten Commandments, you will get this relationship with me. And, and, and the reason you're obeying the Ten Commandments is to get this relationship with me. That should be your motivation. That should be your purpose. So what is this kind of relationship? First of all, priority. And you see that in, uh, in what is said right before the announcement of his jealousy. It says, you shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven or on earth, beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them for I am a jealous God. So point one, what is he talking about here? At least three quarters of the times, if you go look up jealousy in the Bible, look jealous or jealousy with regard to God, at least three quarters of the time or more, what provokes his jealousy is idolatry. Well, what is idolatry? Look carefully. 
What is an idol? Is an idol a bad thing? Is an idol a bad thing? No. An idol is anything. It says so in verse 4. You can make an idol, or you must not make an idol, but the point is you can make an idol out of anything. Anything at all. And God says, if you love anything more than me, that's an idol. And that provokes my jealousy. Why? Because I love you. It's, we're like being married to one another, God says. And it's natural for a spouse to say, I have to have first place. In fact, it's the only way a marriage works. Let me, uh, let me draw from some experience. When I was a young minister in a small town in Virginia where there was no, count, there was no professional counselors in town of 20,000 people, ministers got, uh, did a lot of counseling. I did a lot of marriage counseling. Now, this is the 1970s. This is a small town of Virginia. And yet, it's intriguing how, uh, well, it's intriguing how similar this is. It is true that sometimes marriages were hurt or or were destroyed by bad things. Drink, drugs, porn. Um, A mistress, you know, an actual, you know, lover or something like that. Those are bad things. But usually I found that marriages were unraveling and sometimes went under because good things became more important than the, the, than the spouse. And here's what very often happened. Sometimes the husband or the wife would say, uh, my spouse's parents are more important than me. What her parents say is more important than what I say. Her parents' love is more important than my, than my love. Or... The woman might say, his job is more important to him than me. His job is his real wife. That's what really electrifies him. That's what really turns him on. That's what really galvanizes him. And of course, he's constantly choosing time commitments to his job over me. Or uh, the woman might say, sometimes in where I was, the woman might say, because there were a lot of guys who just didn't understand women, didn't like women, and so they spent all their time hunting and fishing with their buddies. And uh, the wife would say, you know, they're his real lovers, not me. Or the woman might get a career and the husband say, you know, that's the real. See, you, you see what's going on? Good. What's wrong with a career? What's wrong with hunting and fishing with your buddies? What's wrong with your parents? What's wrong with children? Sometimes I would hear, very often the husband would say, she's very, very involved with the children. She loves the kids. She gets excited about the kids. She'll do what I ask. Yeah, yeah, okay, sure. But it's the children See, you can tell what has the functional title to your spouse's heart. You can tell what is their real hope, what is their real joy, and if it's not you, the marriage won't work. You've got to know that you have first place in the heart of your spouse. Not, not, not the, your spouse has to love you first and has to give you the first priority. And when you know it's money and you know it's a job, if you know it's the children, if you know it's his or her parents, if you know it's something else like that, the marriage starts to fall apart. We all know that. That's the end. This isn't a sermon on marriage. Now let's turn to God. God is only asking what any spouse would ask for. And what God is saying is, I don't want you to just serve me, just go through the motions, just go to church, just say, I'm obeying the Ten Commandments. I want you to love me, and I want to have the priority of your life. If anything, If you love anything more than me, if there's anything that gives you more hope than my relationship with me, if there's anything more important to you than your relationship with me, you're provoking my jealousy because I want a relationship with you. And actually, let's let's get down to the street level. When I get up in the morning, I have a chance to pray. Or what if these three people over here are kind of mad at me because I haven't gotten back to them, so I do three emails? Because I, and, and I feel better because now they won't be mad at me. Or what if I've got some big thing and I'm not really ready for it and I really want, in the presentation I want it to be good, so I spend time on that instead of praying. Don't you do that every day? You are choosing. You, you are putting, your arm, you're putting yourself spiritually in the arms of other lovers. You are committing spiritual adultery. It provokes God's jealousy. We have a jealous God, and that is a God who doesn't just want you to go through the motions of obeying him, sitting around saying, what are the rules so I can do it so he can can bless me? That's moralistic therapeutic deism. He wants your heart. He wants your soul. So first of all, it's priority. That's the first thing. 
A jealous God says, I want the priority in your life. I want to be first in your life. You know that place where, where, God, where Jesus says, he says, uh, uh, somebody came up to him and said, I'll follow you, master, but first let me go bury my father and mother. And he says, let the dead bury their dead. You follow me. Let the dead bury their dead. You follow me. What does that mean? And certainly it doesn't mean you should never go to your father's funeral. The point is that Jesus was speaking into a paternalistic culture into a patriarchal culture in which family meant everything and parents meant everything. And what he was actually simply saying was, you have to be spiritually dead not to see that I must come first. And that if you are spiritually alive, and to the degree you're spiritually alive, I will be first in your life even over your parents, even over everything else. That's what it means to say you've got a jealous God. He said, i got to be first. Is he first? Look at you. Look at yourself. Look at your time. What do you do when you first get up in the morning? Then we'll know. Secondly, fidelity. And you know what fidelity is? Love me and keep my commandments. You know, above, I am a jealous God, no idols. Priority. Below, I am a jealous God, obey my commands. God, jealousy means, first of all, priority. Secondly, it means the holiness of your behavior. He wants you to be wise and holy and good. That means you obey his commands. That means it does... It, it, I mean, in some ways, it is, again, like marriage. I made a promise to be my wife's husband. And if I don't feel on a particular day like being my wife's husband, it doesn't matter. i got to be my wife's husband. That's fidelity. See? This is not about my needs being met. It's about my being faithful, fidelity. And God is saying, I want, you to, I want you to show your fidelity to me by obeying me. But you say, okay, well, that, how does that fit into this idea of jealous love? Angered sometimes love that stays love, but, but is, you know, is insistent. Well, so the point is that God's jealous love is insistent on your perfection, God is committed to making you into a breathtakingly beautiful being. Why? Because only when he can love us perfectly because our flaws are gone will we finally be happy. It makes no sense to say God's job is to make me happy because what you want right now will not make you happy. You'll only want what will make you happy when you're holy. Are you following me? Think about this. What if God says, I'm going to come down and meet your needs? Oh, that's great. Would you want him to do that to a five-year-old? Anything the five-year-old wants, God's going to meet his needs. The five-year-old would be dead before the day's out. (laughs) Well, how about a 15-year-old? The 15-year-old would be dead before the month's out. They're they're a little little less stupid than five-year-olds, but you know. And and, uh, listen, okay, what about a 25-year-old? Well, some of you are saying, now wait a minute. I just want you to know that your 50-year-old self will think of your 25-year-old present the way your 25-year-old self thinks of your 5-year-old self. If God would actually start meeting your needs, he wouldn't be a loving God. His jealous love, he's not a grandfather in heaven. You know, he's a father, he's a spouse. His jealous love is to turn you into the kind of person that ultimately is wise and is good and therefore will be happy. And there's nobody, nobody who's put it better than C.S. Lewis in The Problem of Pain, Chapter 3. And this is what he says. You you asked for a loving God? You have one. Not a senile benevolence that drowsily wishes you to be happy in your own way. Not the cold philanthropy of a conscientious magistrate but the consuming fire himself, the love that made the world persistent as the artist's love for his work, provident and venerable as a father's love for a child, jealous, inexorable, exacting as love between the sexes. If I fall in love with a woman, do I cease to care whether she is fair or foul? (laughs) Do I not rather first begin then to care? Love may forgive all infirmities, And love still in spite of them, but love cannot cease willing their removal. Listen, love is more sensitive than hatred itself to every blemish in the beloved. Of all powers, love forgives the most, but condones the least. 
Love is pleased with a little, but demands all. And finally, Lewis says, <clears throat> what we here now call our happiness, quote unquote, is not the end that God has chiefly in view when he loves us. You know why? Because only when we are as he can love us without impediments will we in fact only finally be truly happy. God gives the happiness that there is, not the happiness that is not. To be God, to be like God, or to be miserable. Those are the only three alternatives in the universe. huh? To be God, to be like God, or to be miserable. That's it. He says, if we will not learn to eat the only food the universe grows, we shall starve eternally. God is a jealous God, and he's after your holiness, which is... He said, but I want him to make me happy. Don't you understand? Your happiness is on the far side of, his whole, of your holiness. On the near side is nothing but misery. And therefore, his jealous love says, I am not going to let you live just any way you want. I'm not going to do it. See? Love can forgive flaws, but it can't stop willing them to be gone. Love will not... You, if you love somebody, you can't just sit there and say, that's okay, I don't care how you are. You know that. The more you love someone, the more you say, I'm going to come after you until you're living the way you ought to be because otherwise you're never going to flourish. Otherwise you're never going to have the delight I want you to have. So God is a jealous God, meaning I want a relationship. means he's calling for a relationship of priority. Secondly, of fidelity. And thirdly, of intimacy. Right in the middle, right before he says I'm a jealous God, he says I'm your God. That's covenant language. It happens over and over again. You shall be my people, and I will be your God. God says, when I enter into a covenant relationship with you, you give yourself to me, and I give myself to you. Because, see, when you say, I am yours, what does that mean? What do you you get across when you say, I am yours? I'm at your disposal. I'm giving myself to you in some way. I'm opening myself to you in some way. And so right in the heart... Of, of this discussion of jealousy, God says, I'm, I, I am yours. I give myself to you. Give yourself to me. Let us be intimate. And friends, I, you know, there are philosophical questions, great philosophical questions, theological questions about um, uh, the difference between, for example, legalism and licentiousness. You know, um, today... Basically, most religions, and including the Christian church, tends to be divided between conservative people, churches, which put a lot of emphasis on you better obey, you better be moral, you better be good, or God's going to get you. And that's the, that's the narrative, that's the tone. Or you have the liberal, you have the license, you know, the church say, well, it's up to you. You have to live any way you want. You know, God forgives, uh, and everybody has to decide what is right or wrong for you. And so which is it? Which is it? The answer is the jealousy of God. Angry love that stays love. See, on the one hand, you're not allowed to live any way you want, but the motivation for living has to be love. Or put it this way, when you're falling in love with somebody, you want to know, even if they don't tell you how to live, you want to know what will please them, right? Even if they're not coming up with a list of, I want you to do this and this and this and this, you, go, you, you make your own list. Why? Because the essence of love is this. Your wish is my command. That's the, you know you're in love when you feel that way. You know you're in love. Your wish, you see it as just a wish. You just see it as, as, as almost a, you know, an, a feeling. But your wish is my command. I want to give it to you because I love you so much. It doesn't even feel like I'm obeying anything that you're asking me to do except you are conforming your life to the will of the beloved and that is supposed to be how we relate to God. He says, I'm giving myself to you. You give yourself to me. We're supposed to love him like that. We're supposed to obey him out of love. We're supposed to look at the law of God, the Ten Commandments, romantically romantically. We're supposed, to say, we're supposed to say, your wish is my command. Even if you didn't say, thou shalt not, I would want to know what pleases you and I'd give it to you. That's what a jealous God is looking for. That's what a jealous God calls for. That's what a jealous God demands. Why? Because he loves you. 
relationship of priority, a relationship of fidelity, and a relationship of intimacy, which lastly leads us to the question, how in the world can we possibly answer this call? And I want you to see why. Do you see what a high bar this is? I mean, I, at one point I wrestled a little bit with even preaching on the subject of jealousy of God. Not only do I have very few books, articles, and other sermons on this that I could even use to give me some help, but jealousy seems to combine things. It seems to combine the wrath and holiness of God and the love and mercy of God. It seems to bring them into one thing, and it is. I mean, you all know what this is. When you really love someone and you're losing them or they're hurting themselves, you don't just sit there and say, oh, well. You get angry, but the, there's an angry love. And, of course, because of our sinfulness, that angry love can just turn into nothing but anger, and we just hate everybody around us. Godly angered love is, is angry love that stays angry. But uh, uh, the, the, you realize what, what a high bar this is. Because when God is calling, not just for compliance, but a, an exclusive love relationship, then whenever we sin, we don't just disobey. We don't just break the rules the way you know, a citizen breaks the rules of a king. We don't just break the rules the way a sheep breaks the rules of a shepherd. We are committing spiritual adultery. We're betraying him. We're breaking his heart. And adultery is, as some of you know, you know, whenever I'm, I have not experienced this, uh, and most people haven't, but a lot of you have. There is nothing more wounding. There is much, nothing more grievous. There is no more awful thing than to experience your spouse being unfaithful to you, committing adultery on you. And in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, Adultery was a capital offense. And God over and over says, if you commit adultery on me, O Israel, my people, I will cut you off. That's probably behind what, what um, Joshua says in Joshua 24, verse 19, when he says, you are not able to serve the Lord, for he is a holy God, he is a jealous God, and he will not forgive your rebellion and your sins. And most commentators say it's very strange because, because Joshua is saying you've got to obey him, you've got to give your heart to him, you've got to serve him, you must serve him, you must serve him, you must serve him wholeheartedly. And suddenly he says, but he's a jealous God, you'll never do it. It's almost like Joshua suddenly said, how in the world can people like us be in a love relationship with God? All we're going to do is break his heart. He's jealous. He's going to have to reject us. He's going to have to cut us off. So you see, the... the, the The jealousy of God calls for a relationship which is such a high bar for God. How in the world is he going to be able to keep keep in a relationship with people who are constantly trampling on his heart? But it's a high bar for us because we're not called just to obey him and then look for blessings. We're called to love him exclusively. We're called to fall in love with him. We're called to give ourselves to him. What is the answer? How can we possibly meet this, answer this call and the answer to the question is in the New Testament. You know, in the Old Testament, when God says, I am your God, it's metaphorical. You know, if, if, if I say to somebody, I am at your disposal, and they actually hit me, handcuff me, and take me away as a slave, I would say, I think you're taking me kind of literally. <laughs> well, you said I was at, you were at my disposal. Well, it was a metaphor. <laughs> I just meant can I do an errand for you? I didn't mean to go all the way. I mean, when I said, I am yours, that's a metaphor. And in the Old Testament, if you only had the Old Testament, all this stuff about God saying, I am your God, I've given myself to you, would, um, you you know, it would look metaphorical. But guess what? In the New Testament, it's literal. And in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22 and following, we have Jesus Christ using, being spoken of, and all the metaphor is there about Jesus Christ being the bridegroom and us being the bride. And it says in Ephesians 5.22, Jesus Christ, he says, husbands love your wife, Paul says, as Christ loved the church. And what was he trying to do? What, was, what, is, what is Jesus' love, which is a jealous love, what is its purpose? To make her, us, holy, cleansing her, to present her to himself radiant without stain or blemish. There it is. Jesus is characterized by by 
by a jealous love. And yet, the addition that you don't have in the Old Testament is this. Husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. He gave himself. Envious human jealousy when you push replaces love with anger and we all know that jealous husbands and jealous wives have killed their spouses. They've killed them because the selfishness and the pride just takes the love and destroys it and you don't love them anymore. You just hate them. But we said godly love gets angry but stays love. Human love, if pushed, will kill the lover who rejects. But God's love, when pushed, will die for the one who rejects him. Will die. And has died. He has given himself for us. And you know what? This solves the problem. Why? Why is it that in spite of our spiritual adultery, can God stay with us and not reject us? Because he's received the penalty himself. He's received the rejection himself. He's absorbed the debt and paid the debt himself. And how can you and I move from just moralistic therapeutic deism into actually loving him like this, at least even begin to move in that direction? You have to see that he died to preserve a relationship. How could God's angered love stay love? Because he died for us. Fill your heart with that. You know, I'll tell you something. In the 17th century, it was, it was incredibly um, daring poetry when John Donne wrote this. And it's amazing that it's still daring. It's still actually kind of outrageous. It's still almost over the top. But John Donne said to God, take me to you, imprison me, for I, except you enthrall me, Never shall be free, nor ever chaste, except you ravish me. Let's pray. Our Father, your God, your your love is a jealous love, which means it gets angry, it insists on rescuing us, it insists on our perfection, it, it, it does not let us go, and yet it stays love. And it demands exclusivity, and it demands intimacy, and it demands uh, uh, fidelity. And, Lord, we ask that you would so fill us with a vision of what you are willing to do to rescue us. Uh, Your jealous love is love fighting extinction, and you're willing to die to rescue a crumbling love relationship. We thank you for that. And we thank you that you would go do that. And we pray that you would so fill our hearts with the vision of it that we would begin to love you as you want us to love you and grow in grace until we get to the place where we will truly be happy because we're completely holy and like your son, in whose name we pray. Amen. For more of this series and other resources from Timothy Keller and Redeemer Presbyterian Church, please visit www.gospelinlife.com dot com